Okay, so I think we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our webinar. This is the Cane to Canine Guide Dog Readiness webinar. My name is Katie Otaggio. I am the College Success Program Engagement Operations Manager. So I work on the Learning Allies College Success Program. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Abigail, who's gonna give you a little bit of housekeeping and logistical information. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Abigail Shaw. I help to coordinate the mentorship program here at the College Success Program. Um, so the way this webinar will work this evening is that our moderator um, will be in conversation with our panelists and you can feel free to add questions in the chat, um, but we're going to take all Q&A uh, closer to 5.40, 5.45 p.m. Eastern. Um, and at that time, we'll use the raise hand feature. I'll pull questions from the chat and I'll give you some more specifics on how to do that um, later on if you're not familiar. But thank you for joining and um, enjoy. Okay, um, I think my other colleague Kristen was going to um, just introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, this is Kristen Mataki. Welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm the curriculum and content editor for the College Success Program and I'll be just monitoring the time during this webinar and um, alerting people if they need to move on to the next question. But hopefully you won't hear me, so. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Um, so again, welcome and thank you all for joining. I just wanted to give a quick introduction of our speakers, so who you'll be hearing from today. Uh, first, we have Jake Cook, who is the Community Outreach Specialist at Guide Dogs for the Blind. Jake is, um, he travels with a five and a half year old black Labrador, Labrador guide dog named Forley. Jake's role at Guide Dogs for the Blind includes facilitating awareness and educational opportunities about the guide dog lifestyle and guide dog mobility on a national level to people who are blind or visually impaired and blindness professionals. Consulting with agencies, businesses, organizations, et cetera, about blindness etiquette and best practices for assisting people who are visually impaired and guide dog teams supporting corporate and service organizations, giving philanthropy efforts for Guide Dogs for the Blind, which receives no government funding and provides all services free of charge. In addition to his work with Guide Dogs for the Blind, Jake serves on the Dis Disability Advisory Board with Alaska Airlines. This interdisciplinary board of disability experts is tasked with providing airline executives and staff with current best practices for serving travelers with disabilities. Jake graduated with honors from Eastern Washington University, where he majored in public relations and minored in journal journalism and organizational leadership. In his free time, he enjoys traveling, stand-up paddle boarding, hiking, playing musical instruments like the drum and ukulele, and spending time with family and friends. We also have James Bohm, who is uh, also goes by Jimmy. He is a CSP mentor and web is the moderator today. James is a passionate leader and advocate who values collaboration and empowering others to their fullest potential. Through time and experience, he learned that his disability provided him the ability to serve and engage in so many opportunities that he would have never imagined. He entered college after 14 years out of high school and received a BA in psychology from Middle Tennessee State University and a MS in mental health counseling from Vanderbilt University. He has served as an intern at the Tennessee Rehabilitation Center where he worked with the blind, clients with traumatic brain injuries, and individuals with other disabilities. James also started his own practice, Alliance Counseling, and now volunteers at the Refuge Center, a nonprofit counseling center. James is quite active in many organizations, initiatives, and collab collaborations, including the Nashville Mayoral Council for People with Disabilities, American Foundation for the Blind, Vision Aware, National Federation of the Blind, National Alliance of Mental Health, and many others. He also founded the Custom Cane Initiative, which customizes canes for the blind and donates canes to blind people around the world who can't afford them. In order to unwind from his busy schedule and initiatives, James enjoys time with his family, music, sports, and cooking. James feels that with the proper tools, education, and supports, all individuals can live the life that they were created for. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jimmy to, to kick us off. Nice. Well, thank you so much for those introductions. And wow, that, that was pretty much everything about us. I think we're done, right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Jake, um, I'm glad to, 
to be able to, to talk about this. And before we even get started, just want to just tell you and express um, gratitude for all that, that you do uh, for your organization and what you do for people who are guide dog users. The work that you guys do is, is so important and it's just part of that process um, for those who decide to go with using a, that decide to, to use a guide dog, um, you know, giving them that support and that ability to, to just uh, gain that independence. So anyway, I just wanted to express from the, from the beginning our, our gratitude and thanks to you and, and to GDB. And so, um, yeah, just wanted to, to just briefly touch base with you. Uh, so tell us, just intro introducing yourself as far as um, what you do with, with Guide Dogs for the Blind. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. And a, and a big thanks to everybody who's joined us tonight. And of course, to the uh, Learning Ally CSP team. Couldn't have done it without you guys. Um, so appreciate the opportunity and, and all the logistics and behind the scenes to get this webinar off the ground. So a little bit more about what I do. Um, really the task of the outreach department at Guide Dogs for the Blind, which is the department I work in, community outreach, is to help people make an informed choice about guide dog mobility. What you're not gonna hear tonight from me is a sales pitch. What you are going to hear from me tonight is um, some tools, some tactics, some strategies, um, and some resources for helping you make a personal decision mm. about whether you think a guide dog is the right mobility tool and whether you are ready to take on uh, what we call the guide dog lifestyle. Now, I remember being a young person. I was 19 when I got my first dog. I think that semester I spent more time researching guide dog schools than I did um, on my college term papers. <laughs> so wow. don't take that advice from me. But my point being is that I really wanted to try and learn as much as possible to help me make that decision. I was kind of an indecisive kid. I wasn't the best at making big decisions uh, as most many, many young people are. Um, so I'm hoping that this uh, webinar tonight will help you um, make an informed choice, or at least, you know, get you on the right path to, to considering this as a viable option or not. Um, that's okay too. Right. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. Um, and I like what you said there, uh, the consider, I've never heard it compared to as a lifestyle and how true that is. Uh, both of us are, are guide dog users. And, uh, um, and can you tell us again, what kind of dog yours is? Did you say it was it a Labrador? Absolutely, yep. I've been traveling now um, with three guide dogs. My current guide dog's name is Forli, spelled F-O-R-L-I. She's named after an Italian city, which is very fitting because I just got back from a trip to Europe right before I got her. Um, and she is a black Labrador retriever and uh, she's around here somewhere. She's in the other room taking a nap. Very busy schedule these days with, with uh, naps. So. <laughs> well, I know that's usually one of the things that people always ask first, like what kind of dog is it? What color is it? You know, and stuff like that. So we definitely wanted to give a shout out to the puppies. Um, my dog is a German Shepherd. He's from the seeing eye. His name is Bogey, named after Humphrey Bogart. And he's about six years old. And um, so he's my second. So yours is your third. Um, and you kind of hinted on this, that you said that you were about 19. Is that right? When you started mm -hmm. to, kind of consider getting a guide dog? Yes. So I guess my question to you is, um, how did you decide, what, what got the ball rolling of even considering, okay, do I want to get a guide dog? Yeah, great question. So um, I grew up in a small town in Eastern Washington state, um, learned to use uh, the white cane and received some orientation and mobility training um, was sort of a stop start kind of situation, which is unfortunately often the case in specifically small towns. Um, you know, somebody is serving a district or an area and then they leave an O&M instructor um, to be specific or, or, or TBI, something like that. And then, so, so when I uh, graduated high school, I went out into the big wide world and moved over to Portland, Oregon, which is where I'm speaking to you from today near uh, Guide Dogs for the Blinds, Oregon campus out in a town called boring of all places <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, I was using a cane and it worked you know it, it worked fine but I, I thought about well 
is there something more? Is there some, what, what else is out there in terms of options? I have a little bit of usable eyesight. My condition's called bilateral microophthalmia, which that big mouthful of words simply means small, partially developed eyes. So essentially tunnel vision. So a little bit of usable vision when it cooperates and the lighting is right, et cetera, et cetera. So it sort of started me on this journey of, well, gosh, I'm using a cane and the cane is an equally valid tool to a guide dog. But what else might be out there? I tried monoculars. I have, two, I have an astagmus that's pretty aggressive. So that, that really wasn't effective. So I was really looking for non-visual travel tools. And that led me to a guide dog. I was working at a school for the blind and one of my students had one. So it was an independent living program. So I got to watch them sort of um, the day-to-day -day operation of having a guide dog. And that really prompted me to start looking into it more um, researching schools, talking to other guide dog handlers, calling the schools themselves and asking detailed questions. Um, my biggest question was, you know, what is it going to feel like? Okay, I, I walk with a cane and I'm receiving tactile information through that cane. But what about this guide dog that's helping me walk down the street, that's leading me in a straight line and stopping for these curbs and steps and things? What is that actually going to feel like? And that was my big question that I tried to ask everybody in terms of that um, experience. I grew up with animals uh, around livestock so that the animal husbandry aspect of it was not as big a deal. I mean, I, I knew what I was getting myself into there. It was more just like, well, how is this going to enhance my mobility or not? Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think what got me interested into considering a dog was, you know, as I uh, was adjusting to my vision loss and kind of like you said, going through mobility and instruction uh, also was, was meeting new people and, you know, a couple of my friends had guide dogs. And first I was like, hmm, it's kind of cool. You have your dog with you. Um, but it, as I, you know, practiced more mobility and got to know my friends, it really, it was like you said, it was interesting to see um, them at work, you know, and how their mobility and, and so forth was different. And I think that's kind of what, what sparked my, my interest um, in a guide dog. Um, and so, you know, I think one thing that you mentioned too is the mobility, right? You know, some folks think that um, you just get a guide dog, but you know, the mobility part is that you being able to use the cane is a very important part. But you also have mentioned this a couple times already. You've stressed um, that you did research, that you checked into uh, the schools and you had specific questions. And so I wanted to kind of focus on that for a moment. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the folks that are listening on this call are college students. And so there's, you know, definitely can be mobility challenges there, but speaking directly to them, to our college students, you know, what should be some things that they consider um, when evaluating whether if they want to use uh, or transition to using a guide dog? Yeah, Jimmy, great, great question. And there's certainly a lot, um, you know, we could spend the next five hours <laughs> just answering this one question. We won't, yeah, of course. Minutes. Yeah, five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> but um, what, what I would say, first and foremost, is it's important for you to understand the differences in mobility between mm. white cane mobility and guide dog mobility. Uh, mm. In a very simple way, we'll get into this perhaps later, um, a guide dog is an object avoider, a cane is an object locator. I'm mm -hmm. putting that another way, a dog um, uses the principle of see and avoid. See something, avoid something. A cane is detect and avoid. Detect something, avoid something. So it's important to understand what the role that the guide dog plays, that they're not just going to okay, take me to the nearest Starbucks, or take me to the nearest pizza joint, right? Or get me to my class on time. But really understanding that they're there to help you with the safety aspect, with seeing and avoiding obstacles in, along your route. So I would suggest focusing on that first and understanding what are some of the differences um, and some of the similarities where, you know, how does your orientation and mobility skills help? I could tell you right now, if you're getting orientation and mobility, Please continue to get that because most guide dog schools across uh, North America, at least, are going to require or highly recommend orientation and mobility training because 
We right. need that to build on top of that. O&M is the fundamental foundation of your success, no matter what mobility aid you choose to use. Um, it's in terms of college itself, I was in college when I got my first dog. You might want to think about things like when, when is a good time to apply? Mm. Um, mm. Schools are going to have different lengths in terms of how long is their admissions process? How long is the wait time? Mm. You add in COVID-19. I think we're going to get to that later in the program. Um, mm. But in general, you want to think that you're not, it's not like going down to the Apple store, buying an iPhone and walking out in an hour. Um, you're looking at several months of, of, um, waiting, um, completing different pieces of documentation, things about your mobility, your lifestyle, um, health, low vision reports, references, things like that, that the school is going to need to collect in order to make an appropriate match. And so, you know, if you think, well, I'm just going to graduate high school in June, I'm going to go, I'm going to apply for a guide dog, and I'm going to have everything all set up before I go off to college in August, um, that may not work. Uh, in most cases, it, it won't. So I would think, plan ahead, think ahead. When might be a good time to come in and train with your dog? Mm -hmm. That might be another thing to, to do. And you can always reach out to the guide dog schools, admissions departments directly, um, and they can help counsel you on, on the time frame so that you can plan. But certainly do some research in those areas. Uh, also look at your living situation. Um, do you live in a dorm? Do you live in an apartment? Do you live at home? What kinds of travel are you going to be doing? Is it campus-based travel? Is it urban travel? Is it uh, suburban, rural, a combination of all of that? Th th that's all going to dictate what kind of dog that you're going to get and what your needs are in that uh, for that dog um, while you are in college. Um, yeah, so, so some, some of my recommendations I would say to our college students on the line tonight. That's great. That's great. Those are all really good good things to think about. And, uh, um, you know, one of the things I was disappointed about getting a guide dog and is that um, they're not, they don't do a really good job at doing homework or typing papers. So that's, that's the only downfall. Well, of course, I guess a cane can't do that either, but I'm just kidding. But uh, um, that was trying to be funny. Um, but, you know, you mentioned that, you know, doing that research, um, seeing what your situation, because everyone's situation is different. I know with my personal experience, I was transitioning into college. And so what my mobility instructor recommended to me was to wait a semester to get used to the campus and rather than getting a dog and starting school at the same time. So having to adjust to using a guide dog and learning a campus uh, all at once and for me, that I was, I'm so glad that I did that. It was, it was well worth it. But everyone's situation is different, right? Um, but I think what you're, you're saying there, that's a touch an important point is, is, uh, is the plan, right? Do investigating and so forth. And that kind of goes into our next question. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about some resources. What are some resources um, that are what should what resources should students turn to when they're trying to make this important decision as to, you know, should I get a guide dog or not? Yeah, great question, Jimmy. And I, I really appreciate you talking about the concept of um, waiting a semester before getting a guide dog. That That is so important on many levels. Not to say you couldn't do that, you know, you couldn't transition from high school to college, but certainly a dog is going to create some uncertainty. You're going to have this new dog in your life. The dog is going to be looking to you for leadership. So I think uh, best practice is always to go off to college, get used to things, figure out how to live in a dorm, how to be away from mom and dad for the first time. Um, that's, that's a very um, smart way to go about it and really is becoming an industry best practice for young, um, for young people. Again, not saying that you can't do that. Maybe you, you know where you're going to go to college. You have access to that campus already in high school. You right. and your O&M can set up lessons over on the campus. That's right. fantastic. And if you can do all that, even better. Um, so, so to your question about resources, we talked a lot about research. Well, what does research look like? Well, it, it comes in a variety of formats. Perhaps you're most familiar with research of logging on to the internet, you know, reading something and writing a a term paper on it or writing an essay about it. Well, that's one type of research, but there's also lots of others. Things like perspective, gathering perspectives from people, 
So if you can talk to other people, either, you know, perhaps through a Facebook group, that's safe. Um, I, you know, if you're under the age of 18, of course, with permission, um, if you can go to a conference, um, something like that's put on by the American Council of the Blind, the National Federation of the Blind, et cetera. Oftentimes, there not only will be there, there be guide dog handlers at these events, there will be guide dog school representatives that you could go and speak to directly about this. So just try to get perspective, understand, hey, what has your experience been like having a guide dog? And understand that this everybody's experience is different and it is subjective, right? So you're going to get what someone's experience is. Um, try not to ask them, do you think I should get a guide dog? Because that's a really hard question for a guide dog handler to ask because they don't know your situation and only you can make that decision for yourself. But do ask questions like, what was your experience like? What kinds of things did you find different? What was a challenge about transitioning from a cane to a guide dog? You know, things like that that will help you kind of make a decision about the lifestyle. Another fantastic resource, resource are the schools themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you can contact the schools. Many of them um, have direct access to the admissions department or some like Guide Dogs for the Blind. Our community outreach department have staff like myself. I answer questions weekly from people that call in from all over the US and Canada and we work sort of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So if you're saying, hey, here's my situation. Uh, I wanna do this, this, and this. When do you think I should get a guide dog? That's a great way to do that. So you want to get that perspective as well. So when you've kind of decided, not even decided, but when you've thought, okay, this is interesting to me, how now might I fit the guide dog into my life? When you start asking those more, thinking about those more technical aspects, when should I apply? When should I come to class? Um, hey, this is my current situation. I'm going to be moving. What should I do? That's when you want to sort of seek the assistance of a school who can then help you navigate that process. And I would, I would call multiple schools. Mm -hmm. um, ask them things about their support programs. What happens after I get a guide dog? Are you going to support me long term? Do I own the dog? Do I not own the dog? Think about things that might be important to you going forward. Is your training program two weeks? Is it three weeks? Is it four weeks? Is it in home? Um, you know, again, take a look at the school's website and, and maybe generate a list of questions for yourself to then go and ask the school and ask, you know, ask multiple schools. Um, also attend a specific events. Oftentimes guide dog schools will have learning events like this webinar where you can learn a bit more about the organization itself, the guide dog lifestyle, et cetera. So keep your eye out for those, um, ping your networks. Oftentimes O&M instructors are, are plugged into this stuff or on listservs that might've seen um, something like that. Um, so that would be a great, another great resource. Yeah, that's great. And I think like you mentioned, uh, throughout even throughout the states, there are a lot of um, divisions and groups. Um, like here in Tennessee, where I live, we have the Tennessee Association of Guide Dog Users, but there are other groups. Uh, and a lot of times in each state, um, not in every state, but in many of the states, which is, again, a great way to get connected with other guide dog users and ask these questions. And I always kind of compare it to just as you apply for college, right? You don't just apply to one college. You don't just um, call one college and see what they have. You know, every college is different. They all have a little different uh, focuses. Uh, some colleges offer specific things when others don't. And it's kind of the same with guide dog schools. They're all a little bit different as far as the dogs that they offer. The, maybe the training's a little bit, you know, like you talked about ownership or the services they, they provide afterwards. All those um, vary a little bit. And so I think it's really important to identify what's important to you and then find that school that you feel is a good fit, just like a college, because um, not every college is a, is a fit for us. So I think that's that's really good information. Um, kind of going and transitioning to like the equipment. So a, a guide dog, the guide dog equipment. Um, kind of describe what that basic equipment is that a, a guide dog handler would use. Sure. Um, so there's a variety of, of equipment that, that you would use with a guide dog. Um, we'll just cover the basics today. So a dog um, wears a collar, a leash, and a harness. And of course, the collar is uh, twofold. It's for identification purposes, in case the dog gets lost. That does happen. They do get out sometimes. <laughs> so you always want to keep your dog tags up to date. 
Um, it's also a communication tool. So it's used for communicating with the dog um, while uh, both while the dog is guiding and just reinforcing good behavior. Uh, then you have the leash. Uh, the leash is when you want to lead the dog. So you're healing the dog, the dog is walking next to you, typically on your left, although a dog can be trained on the right. Uh, the standard is the left though. Mm -hmm. um, and so that could be, maybe you're waiting in a line, you're taking the dog out. People ask about how do these dogs relieve? Well, they relieve on leash and on command. And the dog is taught to circle around at the end of the leash and find a spot, to do their business. Um, so the leash is used for those sort of general dog handling activities. You could take your dog on a walk if you wanted to just take your cane out and use that as your mobility aid and mm -hmm. just allow the dog to sort of be a dog, just heel next to you and walk and you guys just enjoy a nice walk together. That's fine. Then of course we have the harness. Uh, the harness is typically made of leather. Some of them are leather, uh, like Guide Dogs Sublime, the, the handle is made out of kind of a PVC plastic type material, it's highly reflective, mm -hmm. but they all do the same thing. And that is the dog wears the harness, buckles underneath the dog's belly and sits on their back. And then it, there's a handle attached to that harness. And as the dog walks, the dog is exerting physical pull into that harness. And the harness is designed to maximize that pull. So if you were actually to use that as a restraint tool, if you wanted to hold a dog back, you would be very, very difficult because that dog has got a ton of leverage by design of the harness. But that means that when you're walking with the dog, you are feeling every tilt and roll of that dog. And Jimmy, I bet you can relate to this as well, where as the, um, you could start to feel your dog becoming distracted or veering or anything like that. The longer you work with them, you, it, it becomes like a fiber optic cable between you and that dog. Absolutely. Um, you and, can definitely tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, so the harness is designed for the dog to be guiding you. So when that harness handle is up, the dog is wearing the harness. They're sort of in work mode, just like when you put your school clothes on or in these, probably these days you put your headphones on and you look at your computer screen, right? Um, you're in school mode. You're in learning mode. You're in work mode. Same with the dog. And, and the dog is going to be focused on keeping you safe put the harness handle down and just be using the leash and healing the dog, the dog is no longer responsible for your safety. And so that's kind of the differences between the basic equipment. And then of course you have things like bowls and for food and water, a bed, grooming tools, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. And I do appreciate that you did mention the cane, you know, because sometimes our dogs do need a break or some sometimes our dogs just need to be dogs. I recently had an interview with Lucas Frank from The Seeing Eye, and one of the things he talked about is how, um, especially in Europe, how uh, canes are actually uh, used more for identification and, and for, mm -hmm. uh, like he said, you know, uh, he was talking about uh, bicycle lanes, you know, to be able to to clear path to to cross and so forth. So it's very interesting, you know, that our canes can actually be a part of our mobility travel with with a with a dog. So that's kind of cool. Now, uh, just a side note, Jake. So like, where do I buy this harness at? So I get the, you know, I go to the school and get the dog. Like, where do I go for a harness? Um, I don't even know where I would get one of those. Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, speaking about guide dogs for the blind, we provide. All of our services free of charge, which includes um, things like the dog. Um, we provide the equipment, and that mm. equipment is designed to last the lifetime of the dog. So, uh, and of course, it can be replaced if need be. Sometimes things break, they wear out, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to procure equipment um, for a guide dog outside of a guide dog school because it is such a specialized, it's such specialized equipment. There's mm -hmm. only a couple of, of small companies in the United States that make harnesses for guide dog schools. Uh, fun fact, Guide Dogs for the Blind sources our harnesses from a, a, a maker, a leather maker in Switzerland. Um, and we've gone with that design for many, many years. Um, but they are hard to, to source and, and procure uh, because of the specialized nature of them. They're fit specifically to each dog. So yeah. you might look at two harnesses and they might look exactly the same, but you know, one is gonna be slightly bigger. It might have a longer belly strap because the dog's um, torso, it, they're all a little bit different shapes. So they're, they're kind of customized to each dog. Right, right. 
Yeah, yeah. thank you for sharing that. I think that's interesting. Um, going to conventions and stuff, uh, when you have the reps from the guide dog schools, it's very always interesting to, you know, as they're kind of describing or they're checking, you know, how dogs are doing. And, and sometimes they have to make some adjustments and stuff, but it's just <laughs> how very, everything about the schools, the programs, even the equipment is very intentional. There's reasons behind why things are a certain way. Um, so going back to uh, a college student, what are some like unique aspects that, you know, in part of a college life that um, they may need to consider when applying for a dog? Yeah, great, great question, Jimmy. And we speak to college students quite often at, at Guide Dogs for the Blind. And so we talked earlier about doing research, looking at your lifestyle and, you know, and figuring that sort of thing out. And that's really what I'm going to focus on now is, so maybe you've decided you want a guide dog, you've talked to some people, you've talked to some schools, you're making an informed choice about this. While it may feel uncertain, you know, you, you're doing your research and it feels like the right thing. So some things to think about are, is timing. As I mentioned earlier, the, the admissions process, I'm going to use guide dogs for the blind for an example, uh, as an example, excuse me. So our admissions process takes about eight to 10 weeks. It's pretty easy. It's one of the very few things in the world today that has not been affected by the pandemic for the most part. You can go to our website, guidedogs.com, complete an application. We're gonna collect information about your route, uh, excuse me, lifestyle. We're gonna ask you to list a minimum of three, what we call destination routes. So it's important to think about what kind of places are you traveling to? Now these destination routes should include around half mile of walking round trip. So kind of break that down a little bit more. So what we mean by that is we wanna make sure that you have what we call purposeful travel, that you're leaving your home, you're leaving your dorm, you're leaving your wherever you uh, reside and you are going somewhere. And that's to help us determine need. Now need is a very, very, very subjective thing. Jimmy's need in a guide dog, for example, is much different than my need in a guide dog, which is much different than Abigail's need in a guide dog, et cetera, et cetera. And it changes, so, right? Changes. It, yeah, it changes yeah. as you get older. So, mm -hmm. but for our purposes, we use um, route travel to help us determine, one, is this an appropriate fit for a guide dog? Meaning, do you have the appropriate lifestyle to, to facilitate guide dog mobility? And two, what does that look like? There are some people that walk three or four blocks a day, mm -hmm. and there are some people that walk three or four miles a day. Right. So, so that's really important to think about the types of travel that you're doing. A half mile round trip is pretty short. It's about three to four blocks one way, distance wise. So if you think walking across the campus, walking down to a coffee shop, grocery store, place of worship, the, the destination to us doesn't matter. It's that you're getting out there and you're walking. But maybe you think, well, gosh, I take public transit, no problem. If you walk to the bus and then get on the bus and then maybe you transfer buses or to a train or something, that all counts as a, as a route, okay? So you wanna think about where you're going, types of destinations that you're um, traveling to or planning to travel to, mm -hmm. timing. So when should you apply for a guide dog? Um, knowing that it takes about eight to 10 weeks for the application process, I can tell you right now, the wait time for a guide dog a guide dogs for the blind is around 12 months and that's solely because of the pandemic right in a normal time it would be about four to six months so make sure that you know how long the wait time is the average wait time at the school is because that will help you to plan if you are applying for a dog you know you might want to start now um, hopefully the vaccines will continue to roll out and we can speed the process up um, but it's really important to look at wait time. It's really important to look at how long is this all this going to take me? Because you might decide, oh, I'm going to leave high school or I'm going to go off to college and I'd really like to have that dog set up and I'd love to be set up by day one of my first semester. Well, depending on when you apply, you know, if it's June 10th and college starts October 15th, or sorry, August 15th, it's, it's not going to happen in most cases. So that's another thing to think about. Also, the type of environment that you live in. 
And what is your willingness to take on a living being? Does this mean that you can't go out and party and have a good time with your friends? No, you can absolutely do all those things with a dog. Does it mean that you have to be responsible for that dog and its well-being? Absolutely. So, so it's kind of crazy because I think this conversation is so interesting and we could go on for hours. But I look at my clock and I'm like, oh, my God, we only have like 10 minutes to questions. Oh, God. So, okay. I know. It's crazy. Um, so I don't know if you could just talk about like the training and a little bit about what it's like after just quickly. That'd be great. So, um, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. So yeah, I'll talk um, briefly about training here and sort of what happens after that. That's a great question. So you've applied, you've done all your research, you've found a good time to, um, to come in for training. Now what? Okay, so you're issued a class date. Um, and that class date is flexible. Obviously, if you're a college student, we're going to want to know that and we're going to try to find one that fits within your time frame. So you like me when I went to um, get my first guide dog, which actually did also come from the seeing eye. I spent um, a very hot and humid July in Morristown. <laughs> so mm. chances are, if you're a college student, which I was at the time, you will probably be going in the summertime or maybe over a winter break, that sort of thing. Uh, guide Dog Sublime offers a two week training program. We have a two to one client to instructor ratio. So this means two clients, that's you, the person who's blind and visually impaired training with your dog, to one instructor. Bottom line, highly customizable, short class periods. Okay, so you're gonna spend a lot of time with your new dog and your instructor working together. All the information we collect on the um, application and through the process, we keep all that information because we wanna know what kind of routes are you traveling in. If you're a college student and you're on and off campus and you're in an urban environment, we are gonna take you to a college campus near our two locations in Boring, Oregon, outside of Portland, and in San Rafael, California, outside of the San Francisco Bay area. And we're going to expose you to that experience, teach you how to travel through those open type environments, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to spend two weeks doing that with you. And it's an intensive training. It's not overwhelming, but it is very busy. So uh, another thing I recommend is a lot of people go, well, well, could I just, maybe I could take a semester off, I could do distance learning, I could come into class, and I could do my homework and keep up with class while I'm getting a guide dog. I highly recommend you don't do that because guide dog training is a physically demanding um, experience as well as an emotional one. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting. It could be a little bit nerve wracking. It's a new type of travel. It's life changing. So you really want to try and allocate those two weeks, in our, in our case, um, you want to allocate those that time to your dog, to the instruction that you're receiving, so that you can maximize your time with us. Now, once you leave class, we have follow-up. A follow-up is a system that supports you after graduation. So once you go home with your new dog, let's say you get home and all of a sudden it snows. And you're like, crap. What did my instructor say about the snow? Well, you can refer to our lecture materials, which encompass all of our standard procedures, our emergency procedures for working a dog. But it's the user manual, essentially. Right. You can also call our support center. It's like tech support for guide dogs. It's staffed by guide dog mobility instructors, guide dog handlers, and vet veterinary professionals. So any issue you may have with your dog, you can call us from eight to five Pacific, Monday through Friday, we also have an emergency after hours line as well. So we can help you with anything that you might need. We also partner with Be My Eyes. So if you want to call us as a graduate through Be My Eyes um, and talk via video chat, we can assist you with things as well. Um, if, if the phone doesn't work or Be My Eyes is just not enough support, we also have field service managers. These are regionally based guide dog instructors they are going to come visit you in your home and help troubleshoot the problem one on one. So whatever the issue may be, we want to be there. We want to help. And we can do that with you in your home. And sometimes that includes customizable training. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of support. I will tell you, we want you to call our support center. We want you to let us know how things are going. It is not a mark of your handling ability. 
We never want to take a dog away from somebody. We, that is not our mission. That is not our role. We have a bias to serve. We want to troubleshoot things. In fact, the more you call, the more likely you're going to be successful because yeah. by waiting and letting an issue get bigger and bigger and bigger, it, it creates other issues down the line and it's harder to address. Right. So we always encourage people, take advantage of our follow-up services. They're available to you free of charge in all the 50 states and Canada. And we are here to serve you and empower you to be the best version of yourself. So that's a little bit about follow-up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because that's the bottom line is that the schools want us to succeed. They want us to succeed as a guide dog team. So they invest in the dogs, but they also invest in us too as, as guide dog users. So you guys want us to succeed and do well. So we, we do appreciate that. Um, were you going to share something else? Oh, we no, have, yeah, we have like literally about two minutes till questions. So okay. I, I wondered if each of you could could just sort of briefly reflect on, you know, if you could go back to your younger self um, and maybe give advice or like, what's one thing you wish you had known before you learned it for the first time, maybe the hard way, hmm. or just some advice that you'd give to a younger person as a guide dog handler. Go Jake. Okay, so I, I thought about this question and there's a lot of things I could give um, if you don't learn anything else, um, what I recommend is the three things you should always, always, always do with your dog. And they are navigate, communicate, advocate. And I will quickly summarize what those mean. Navigate means you know where you're going, you're maintaining your line of travel, you're, you're staying what's called situationally aware, and, and you're using all of those O&M skills um, to, to their advantage to get you to where you need to go. Communicate means uh, communicate effectively and consistently with your dog. Okay, dogs are black and white creatures. They're not like humans where they, we have, they're very, you know, we can understand um, tons of emotion and, and nuances and, you know, body language and all that. I mean, they can understand some of that, but not to the level that we can. They don't speak English, we don't speak dog. So communicate with them. And also be open to receiving communication back. Understand what your dog is trying to tell you. Nine times out of 10, that dog is right. So always follow the dog, follow what that dog is trying to communicate with you and take them seriously. And finally, advocate. Advocate for yourself whether you and your dog, whether you need to sit at a certain place at a restaurant, you wanna book a certain seat on an airplane, but also advocate for your dog's needs. Uh, mm -hmm. Do your very best to keep them safe. Avoid situations that could be dangerous, like aggressive dogs. Um, and really advocate for your dog's needs who can't always speak for themselves. So that's what I would say if I was to give any advice to anybody, especially young people, it is to navigate, communicate, and advocate with your dog. Nice, nice. I think for me, um, I would say learn that it's okay to make mistakes we that's how we learn we and that's just in life in general we learn because we make mistakes and we learn from those so things aren't always going to go perfect our dog isn't a perfect animal we're not perfect people so just to recognize that it's okay to make mistakes i would say trust right that's something that we develop over time learn to trust our dog and that was really hard for me like you said because our dogs are object avoiders and so you're giving up that that sense of being in control and you're trusting in this dog so that takes time we build that up with time and then the last thing that i would say would be learn to be patient you're not going to be the expert guide dog user on day one <laughs> not on day 30, not after six months. You know, for me, I, you know, my trainer said it's going to be about a year and a half. And I tell you, it was about a year and a half that one day it just clicked. And I was like, man, we just did that. And it was about a year and a half, you know. And so just we have, be patient, be patient. It will come. Yep. Solid, solid advice. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks. Thanks. This has been so fun, and I'm going to interject myself here to just let everybody know if you have questions, you can keep adding them in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go through the ones that people have already shared, 
and then we'll, go, we'll if we have time, we'll move on to people. If you want to raise your hand and ask your question individually, um, the quick key on a PC is Alt Y, Option Y on a Mac. Um, it's star nine if you're calling in from a good old fashioned phone. So the first question came from Lori B and she wanted to know if you all had any specific names of Facebook groups where people could join to ask questions about guide dogs and exploring that. Yeah, good question. Um, so there's, um, I think quite a few of them out there. Um, I, what I would do honestly is just go up to the search bar in Facebook and just type in guide dog or things like guide dog handlers. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes there'll be regional groups, maybe to your area. Um, another place to go to is just go to the consumer group web, web pages. So NFB and ACB in your state, oftentimes they, well, they do have divisions. Um, right. You got national association of guide dog users under NFB and then uh, guide dog users incorporated Mm -hmm. uh, under ACB and oftentimes they have connections so that might be another place uh, and uh, those are on Facebook so I would go to the consumer group website first um, if you if you can't find anything through the search bar within Facebook um, and give that a try mm -hmm. that that's just, that was my same answers as well there's a lot of groups out there so um, yeah those are probably the top ones I would recommend as well excellent we also have some friends from the uh, Israeli Guide Dog Center. Very cool nice. that you're joining us. Wow, they cool. They wanted to know about younger um, youths applying for guide dogs. And I know as a handler myself, most North American schools generally um, 18 is the age, but I know a lot of schools will consider applicants as young as 16. Um, Jimmy or Jake, do you want to add anything to that? I know it's very school specific about younger applicants. Sure. Um, speaking about guide dogs for the blind, we we do not have a posted minimum or maximum age requirement. Um, so what we use is we use our application criteria, legal blindness, previous orientation and mobility training, and a minimum of three destination routes. We also use things like maturity level. Um, so we, we really handle this on a case by case basis. Um, the youngest graduate of our school was 13. Per, I met the guy, super mature, um, had places to go, people to see. Um, so we will assess people under the age of 18 and we do regularly, um, but we wanna make sure that there's a level of maturity that's conducive to working with a dog, uh, taking care of a dog, and then also that the support system is on board. Parents, um, orientation and mobility specialists, school staff, etc. Just to make sure that the transition is going to go smoothly and that there's a team of people for that young younger person that can help support them because they're still developing too and we want to make sure that every everybody's feeling good about the situation. Yeah, I think that that nails it. You know, there's, I've met 30 something year old people that aren't ready for a guide dog. <laughs> but there's <laughs> folks like that in routines, like you mentioned, that are just very mature. And and so that's what I've discovered. A lot of the schools kind of have that policy. It's more of a case by case rather than a number. So yeah, great, great question. Cool. So we had some feedback from, um, I think, an o &M instructor or a TBI named Jane. I'm going to pass this. Um, it's a pretty longer comment so I'm going to share it with Jake later but just she wanted to emphasize the need for schools to consider accessible formats for forms when um, applicants are applying mm -hmm. um, but I'll pass it along to Jake Jane and let's see Tony wants to know um, again we're not trying to convince anyone to apply to any particular school here but Tony wanted to know if you all could speak to the um, intensity levels of training between guide dogs for the blind and the seeing eye. Oof. Want to take a stab at that one, Jimmy? Intensity. So the difference between intensity between the schools. I think Jake mentioned it earlier. It's intense. It's a big decision. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of, it's a commitment. It's a change in, in lifestyle, as Jake mentioned. Um, I don't know how we could compare one school to another. Um, 
because there's also going to be some variation, right? Trainers, you know, one trainer may uh, be different than another trainer in the, in the same school. You know, they're pretty consistent, but there's going to be some variation. Um, but I would say every program is, is intense in its own way. Um, I tell you, I slept really good those nights that I was uh, going through training at the seeing eye. <laughs> um, you get some really, really good sleep. So I guess my answer to that is that um, it's intense, but you know, anything that um, is so special and, and such an empowering um, experience, it's, it's gonna take investment and it's, and it's gonna take, um, yeah, some intensity. What about, what do you say, Jake? Yeah, uh, great, great point there, Jimmy. And, and, and certainly, um, you know, like learning any new skill, there's always a, a learning curve. And uh, I would say that, you know, yeah, things are intense for sure. I wouldn't let that intimidate you. Um, it's, it's enjoyable uh, as well. Um, it, is, it is work and you are learning as you're going along and there is that learning curve. But it's also to remember that schools are very well equipped to handle this. They've, I mean, both Guide Dogs for the Blind and the Seeing Eye have been around for decades and decades. Um, and so we have, you know, years and years of history on what makes a comfortable class, what makes a successful guide dog team, tons of data on that. So mm -hmm. apart from the class, um, the, the training, you know, it's very comfortable. Your meals are provided to you. Everybody raves about the food, no matter what school you go to. Um, and I believe that morale is built around the dinner table. It's food is really important um, for, for nourishment and also for, for morale. Um, we, there are nursing staff um, to support you with any additional needs. Your instructors, these people are trained to observe you as an individual and to help you uh, customize your learning experience so that it is not overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So while it may be a learning curve, um, it's something that's very doable and um, it's customizable. So it can be made to fit your specific needs. Um, so I guess that's probably the best way to describe it is, you know, class, that's kind of what class is like. And you're learning a new skill, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes who right. all really want you to succeed and are doing everything they can to help you be the best version of you. And, and it's okay to make mistakes. You know, that's what we're there to do in class. If you don't make a mistake in class, I don't think you're doing it right. Um, right. So, yeah. Exactly. And I think that that's so true. Like you said, these schools have been doing it, um, you know, the, just we mentioned these two schools, but a lot of the school, most of these schools, there is 80, 90 years worth of experience. So like when I went through training, when I've talked to these different schools and, uh, and instructors, they are incorporating 80, 90 years worth of experience and so they've thought of everything. They've seen everything. And so as Jake's mentioned, when you go, when you see certain things in the application or if they ask specific questions or if they do things a certain way or they say, this is how you're going to do this with this dog, there's a reason behind it because they've got that 80, 90 years of, okay, we've had this situation. How do we, what do we do about that? And so I think that's what, I think, thanks for balancing that out, Jake, because yes, it is intense, but again, they're setting us up to succeed and they're with us every step of the way, which is which is also makes it an awesome experience. Great, so we had two questions that kind of correlate um, and continuing to keep an eye on the time as we respond. But um, one participant was curious about discrimination and your experiences. And I think this other question from a student about disclosing um, your guide dog and communicating with professors about your guide dog. So I thought maybe you all could speak to some of the legal protections under the ADA as far as discrimination and disclosure um, might go. And um, pick it up. Yeah, so um, my experience has been overall, most people appreciate uh, and, and or at least acknowledge the power and the benefit of a guide dog. There have been um, dozens of movies over the decades and newsreels and media. There still is. all the, I just uh, finished a, a media interview this morning. So um, it, it, it's something that I think people are very, very much aware of. And, and if something 
comes up, if, if the forms of discrimination that I've experienced thus far usually just come lack stem from a lack of understanding or somebody just made a mistake. I must admit, over the past five to ten years, with the rise of the fraudulent service animals, emotional support animals, etc., it has made it a little bit more difficult for um, business owners and others out in the general public to understand what the difference is between a guide dog and other types of service and or emotional support and or fraudulent mm -hmm. service animals. So um, it, it does happen. Mm -hmm. Part of this training at a guide dog school is um, conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. So how do you communicate in a discriminatory situation that leaves both parties feeling good about the situation? Most of the time you can clear it up pretty simply with a simple definition um, and a simple little piece of education, but there's a whole checklist that we help um, all of our clients. I'm pretty sure the seeing eye is the same way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Go through and, and make sure that you know what to say. Um, we even provide some documentation, sort of pseudo documentation, like IDs. They don't they don't carry any weight, but they help educate people. So it says right. something like, "This is a guide dog from Guide Dogs for the Blind." Um, they're allowed in all public places. Here's the Americans with Disabilities Act law that says so, just to kind of help underscore the, that point. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, what you mentioned, Jake, is that the schools, that's part of the training is not just learning how to use the dog, but learning how to advocate. And so I know with the seeing eye, and it sounds like with GDB, that's part of that training is also to equip us to be able to advocate for ourselves in the use of our dogs. The thing I would just encourage folks to do again is reach out to these different organizations, uh, divisions or, or, or groups in, in your area or, or nationally, because these are places where you can ask those questions. And again, reach out to the schools. You have, you have an issue with a professor or a university. You know, one time I had an issue with the dorm um, having a, a, a guide dog. Um, but, you know, I was able to get that support through a guide dog organization and uh, through the school itself. So they're there to support us. There's a lot of um, resources out there. Yeah, and I just add real quickly about the should you disclose your um, the question about disclosing your dog, uh, the fact that you have a guide dog to a professor. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this this varies widely from person to person. What I would say is, if you feel the need to do so, if you feel like by doing so would um, move a conversation along or would um, help with an accommodation that you need. Um, so that there's basically that it has utility. There's a reason. There's a reason for for disclosing that. Mm -hmm. Feel free, um, but you certainly by no law. There's no regulation or policy or anything um, that says you have to disclose that information. So it's totally up to you how you want to handle that. Right. Me personally, I didn't disclose, but I can see reasons why someone may disclose. So you know, like you said, it's personal preference. Oh. We have, you have the right to decide whether if that's something you want to disclose or not. And um, you have the right to, to do that. Thank you. One last question. Um, and I'm sorry if we didn't get to get to everyone. This has been really great. And uh, we may be able to follow up. We generally post a blog post um, summarizing the, the webinars. But real quickly, um, do we had someone inquiring about uh, applicants with multiple disabilities and if the seeing eye and guide dogs for the blind work with um, people that have multiple disabilities? As far as the seeing eye, uh, yes, they do. And, and so to regarding what those specific disability disabilities are and what they offer, again, you know, reaching out to the school. But yes, they have definitely, I know many examples of where they've um, uh, assisted with people with multiple disabilities. Yeah, similar answer here. Um, you know, everybody is assessed on a case by case basis. Um, certainly, um, as long as a person is able, um, you know, falls under our other criteria in terms of um, mobility, legal blindness, um, destination routes, that they are ready, they have the ability to take care of a dog, understand instruction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, um, everybody is, every application is handled on a case by case basis. And so if you have a specific need or question about that, I do encourage you to call the schools. Um, I'm going to give you Guide Dog's phone number just off the top of my head here. It's 
five zero. When you get to the phone tree, just press either the number zero or number four for the admissions department. And um, somebody can answer your questions. It might even be me. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, we have reached our time together. Um, I just want to thank all of our attendees. Um, it's so cool to see people joining from across the globe. And thank you, especially to Jake and Jimmy for having this conversation with us. Um, if folks want to reach out to any of us here at the College Success Program, you can email csp at learningally.org. Uh, we are on Facebook and Twitter. And um, thank you all again. Katie, am I missing any wrap-up details? Nope, I think you got it all. Great. Um, this webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel, and we'll have a transcript available later on. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Pleasure speaking with you, Jimmy, and, and thanks to the CSB team for uh, having me on. Thank you both for coming. <laughs> Bye. Take care. All right, bye everybody. See ya.